So hola Fernanda. So I just wanted to uh, let everyone know that actually today we're going to be in dialogue. So I'll have some questions for Fernanda regarding her wonderful book, Psychoanalysis, The Body and the Oedipal Plot, A Critical Re-Imaging of the Body in Psychoanalysis. And Fernanda has some questions for me regarding my uh, first book, Decolonial Psychoanalysis, uh, Towards Critical Islamophobia Studies. Uh, but I wanted to also drop in the fact that we uh, collaborated on this virtual read-through of my screenplay, Oedipus Kingsley. I think we did it December 2021, if I'm not mistaken. Is yes. that correct? Yeah. And so, and we did a virtual read-through that was very successful and Fernanda uh, played uh, a part in that. So I thought that would be fun. So I'll put a link for that if uh, folks are interested. So Fernanda, would you kindly tell us a bit about yourself, uh, your relationship with psychoanalysis and how you got into psychoanalysis in the first place? Yes. Well, first of all, thanks, Robert, because also another important part for me is that I know Robert from a study group where we used to be together there uh, every Sunday we could, and we would read many texts on the colonial psychoanalysis, on psychoanalysis and occultism, and I think, well, and also on feminisms. No, so I think that, uh, I hope these, these questions you're going to make to me, I will also make some questions to you, relating your work, but also things that even if I got to know you in the study group, I don't know about you. And I think that might be meaningful in your work. And that also speak of forms of being psychoanalyst that are not constricted to European thought, maybe, no? So, well, the reason why I started being a psychoanalyst, I think has to do with this because I grew up with a family of witches in some, uh, in somehow, you know, I had a lot of aunts that used to read the tarot and even if they wouldn't teach me, I would see them, you No, know? so it was a little bit like an Almodovar picture because everything, every form of giving a narrative to the world had this magic, which also kept, uh, what was part of reality, you know? So uh, when I was like 10 years old, 11, I used to be the witch of my school in recess. And all my friends, I, I used to be in a very Catholic school that used to be part women and part men. And what we would call then without of course knowing the, the differences of course, that there are, we used to call the Berlin Wall to the wall that separated us, no? And that kept <laughs> us apart and we would suffer for that. Of course, we can think that's stupid, but well, that's how we called it. And from there, you know, uh, as young women growing, we would have a lot of questions on how those men operated, you no? Know? So part of that was that that opened, I think, that sense of trying to know about the world and people coming to me and asking me questions and me saying, I have no idea, but tell me about your dreams, you no? Know? So they would come to me, tell me about their dreams. I would read the tarot and I would also say, I don't know what this means, but I think it means blah, 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 you no? Know? So many times when I would say, something about my friend's dreams and about that tarot interpretation, it would become true, you know? So that kept me thinking like, what is this? Why is this happening? And what are dreams, you know? So from that question stemmed a lot of readings that I used to find that are, were like these um, small books that one could find in the metro station, you no, know, mm -hmm. about, <laughs> dreaming interpretation and there appeared a citation on Freud and that's what made me read Freud and so from a young age I decided I wanted to be a psychoanalyst even if I was good at math or whatever you know and it was in this sense of wanting to research and wanting to listen to 
people dreaming, no, and wanting to connect with that. So I grew up, I, I, I tried to find people who did psychoanalysis. And in that time, they told me that you had to study psychology to be a psychoanalyst or medicine. So I studied psychology to become a psychoanalyst. Mm. Of course, that was false, no? But the thing is that I had a bias and I kept asking people that used to study in the associations that were from IPA and here in Mexico, that used to happen, no? Mm. So that's what mainly brought me to psychoanalysis and has kept me there for now many new interests no and and you robert because i can remember that you have a lot of interests as well no mm -hmm. not only psychoanalysis but also philosophy and cinema and yeah no yeah i mean that's fascinating i'm just curious do, do you still find the tarot significant or do you feel like you moved on from that just out of curiosity to me, it is a significant practice for myself, yeah. but I do not practice it in, in my practice and yeah. in any other place. Mm -hmm. I thought of Alejandro Khodorovsky too, who is someone I greatly admire, Chilean artist that lived in Mexico for a number of years and invented a field so called psychomagic, which combines psychoanalysis with the magical realism of Latin America. So that's something interesting that came to my mind as you were talking. But we have actually a similar background. So you, you grew up in Mexico and you practice, you live in Mexico City, right? Mm -hmm. And I grew up in Cairo, Egypt, but I went to a Catholic school as well. So we have that in common. I went mm -hmm. to a Jesuit school, French Catholic school for basically all of my schooling, 12 years, called Collège de la Sainte Famille, also known as Jesuit. My, yeah, my background before getting into psychology and psychoanalysis formally was really theater, music, and film. And I'm still engaging with music more than theater and film at this point in my life. But how I got into psychoanalysis really was uh, through the arts. It was through surrealism. As someone who was an artist in Egypt, who was part of an underground art movement, you know, I was very active. I was producing plays. I was making films and uh, as a young person, and I loved surrealism, both in terms of paintings of Salvador Dali and René Magritte and the like, but also in terms of cinema, Luis Buñuel, David Lynch, Alejandro Khodorovsky and others. So I was fascinated by that world. And obviously anyone that's familiar with surrealism knows that it primarily deals with dreams and the unconscious. So I got curious about psychoanalysis through surrealism. So that was how I got into it. I wanted to learn more about the science behind dream interpretation and all of that. So I got curious and in college, I read Freud and Jung and the rest is history, as they say. And of course, it's relevant to mention that, you know, Lacan himself was very much connected with the surrealist movement at its inception. And that's something that a lot of people forget, I think. Sometimes people's approach to psychoanalysis is very serious and it's missing this artistic, poetic, surrealist dimension, which has to do with humor, has to do with creativity. And I think that's something that Lacan embraced and was aware of. In many ways, you can look at his seminars as and, their, and his performance as a surrealist act. And yes. people miss this point, I think, right? Yes. I absolutely agree. And also, I think that uh, uh, surrealism is so... Uh, uh, no, anyhow, also art is seen as if it was something not serious, no, which is, right. which is also interesting. I like yeah. that that you like surrealism. I am very engaged on that also, and on mm -hmm. Salvador Dali's yeah. uh, of, of interpretation, right? He right. had this paranoid method of interpretation, which is very similar to how psychoanalysis works, right? So, I mean, I, th that link between a surrealism and psychoanalysis is, is very important to me. I think it's, and in many ways, you can encounter the unconscious in a more direct way through surrealist art and, you know, cinema and that kind of thing. And that's basically what fascinated me. So here's my first question regarding your book. So in your book, you survey the different theorizations of the body in psychoanalysis. You make a distinction between the anatomical body or soma and the psychical body, which is a cultural and political archive, basically how we internalize signifiers from the other. First, uh, our 
primary caregivers, but then the culture at large, society. So would you say more about this distinction and how it relates to the subject's division between the ego and the unconscious? Yes, uh, to me, this erogenous body is not only political and social and cultural, but it's also the political, social and cultural being incarnated, no? And so to me, the difference is that the biological body is a somatic body that is born, but it, it is lost in a sense, in the sense that it depends on others and different than any other animal, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Any other mammal can um, be born and then keep on living through instincts, but human beings can't because even if there's an instinct for uh, eating, no, or the, this somatic body will fall if nobody captures it and puts it into culture. And that gives human beings the problem of being in an erotic encounter all the time, no? being subjectivized, being bodily formed through the intervention of others who even give us skin. It is not that we come with skin, of course we have biological skin, no? but the boundaries of our skin, the boundaries of our, the way we conceive ourselves are always in, the, in contact with another. No? So in that sense, that's how I think somehow our bodies are also political territories, geographical territories, who that, that are formed through the desire and through interaction. No? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I think that's the main difference for me. And connecting this with your work, Robert, I would like to ask you, in the colonial psychoanalysis, you speak mm -hmm. of the importance of a method of a specific method of research, which is discursive, no? Mm -hmm. uh, and which is um, always engaging with what the other one has to say, I found really valuable in the colonial psychoanalysis that it was not only a theoretical um, point of view, but that you also made some interviews mm -hmm. to many people, right? Would you right. tell me about that more? Yeah, um, so it, it... Half of the book is uh, theoretical, I would say, and the other half uh, is empirical. And, uh, you know, obviously the two crisscross. So basically, I wanted to use a radical qualitative research method because I was dealing with a topic that is very, you know, you're talking about the psychical body as a cultural and political archive. So think about the psychical body of Muslims in the context of the war on terror discourse, right? And the kind of signifiers that exist in the culture that basically link Muslimness with terrorism and the effect of that on the body in terms of symptoms and all of that. So, of course, this was the intervention is to kind of problematize the way Islamophobia was being talked about in the larger culture, was being understood in the culture, but also the way it was being studied in psychology. So I found that the way it was being studied, it was in a quantitative way, so mostly a statistical, and it was mostly giving these surveys to white Americans to see if they're Islamophobic or not, right? Mm -hmm. So the Muslim voice was missing from this equation. So I decided I want to do a qualitative study where I do I conduct interviews. And I wanted to center Muslim voices. So I interviewed 19 U.S. Muslims about their uh, experiences with Islamophobia. And I wanted to have their accounts. But more importantly, I wanted to know how they resist Islamophobia. Because one of the problematic terms that I found in the literature was this coping with Islamophobia. Coping. So, uh, you know, that term is a big term in psychology. How you cope with something. And I didn't like the idea that if you are experiencing oppression, why should you cope with it, right? In a way, it implies that you have to accept it and there's nothing you can do to change it. So I wanted to challenge that by, by documenting how U.S. Muslims are actually actively resisting Islamophobia, not only discursive through their critical knowledge and how they challenge dominant paradigms, but also through their very being, which I, in this sense would include the psychical body that you write about. 
So one of the key methods that I use was Lacanian discourse analysis. Yes. And also, well. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. No, and also I found in your work that we have many points point of view in common that are treated in different ways. For example, uh, the difference you make uh, for towards a decolonial psychoanalysis instead of a postcolonial psychoanalysis, the idea of liberation versus the idea of liberal the liberal idea of liberty, right? Psychoanalysis as a practice of liberation, uh, and also that you put a lot of emphasis on the subject being a political subject, mm -hmm. you know, and that psychoanalysis can serve for political purposes and that psychoanalysis should be politicized, right? Absolutely. Also that the, uh, your fight, like, I don't know if to say like a fight or a defense towards epistemic justice, which I also find very important. And it's, I, I wanted to comment that because it's usual to start seeing this kind of gestures and points of view within academic psychoanalysis. But I think that many times within practice in psychoanalysis, this is dismissed. You know, true, true. For the sake of thinking of, of singularity in an equivocal way. I'm, by this, I mean that it is thought to be uh, as if singularity is individuality. You no. Know? Mm. Right. What I really like in your work is that you try to fight this liberal idea of liberty, no? Mm -hmm. And try to fight this sense of individuality towards the sense of connection, towards the sense of listening, towards the sense of dismantling a master discourse within uh, the political, no? Right, which we all internalize and we have to all resist it. And that's one of the, the key findings in my research is how that Islamophobic discourse is internalized by both the participants and myself. And that's what I try to expose and work through because, you know, that's something also that is relevant for the clinic is that we internalize oppressive discourses that, that exist around us, right? And so the clinic is not a vacuum, right? And uh, the same thing with the interview. So here's my next question. You make the argument that the signifier Oedipus continues to be relevant, even if the Oedipal plot is problematic. So you problematize the Oedipus complex to show that it's a particular myth which had a historical function during Freud's time, but which is limiting how analysts are listening to the bodies of their analysands today. So how can we listen more freely in the clinic today beyond the Oedipal plot? By not bringing the Oedipal plot to to our forms of listening, but to opening up and to start questioning if there are other forms of symbolization that not necessarily pass through that. But that's really difficult because, for example, well, we can think of this in clinical terms, no? And I can think of something that might sound very stupid, but it, these examples, I think, that bring, bring in what happens in clinical practice, no? For example, some woman can come in and tell me, Fernanda, I decided I do not want to marry, no? And maybe I can be like, no? And start connecting what she has said in different sessions, for example, about her father, about her mother, about the loss she felt when she was little from, no? And say, well, she has, think, no? Well, she has a problem in connecting. So my question through that way of thinking would be something like, uh, and why do, don't you want to get married? No? And it sounds as if it was a neutral question, but it already has something in the desire of the analyst that is not about listening, intervening. No? Mm. Or for example, the analyst could ask, well, and then what do you want? No? Which is uh, another form of uh, having another prejudice somehow, no? But it might be a prejudice <laughs> that still keeps um, different political perspectives in question within the, the analyst's 
the the analytical place, right? So what I try is to do that, but also to talk with people from different disciplines so that my year does not become only the way um, usually psychoanalysis has thought of listening, no? So for example, I think that this can be very clear, but it becomes more difficult when we think in, in terms of more difficult subjects that have to do, for example, with the end of an analysis, no? In Lacanian analysis, uh, for those who do think there's an end of analysis and that to be an analyst, one has to pass to an end of analysis. The idea of end of analysis is that neurosis will go in the neurotic transference from the analyst to the analyst. And when the analyst can fall from being that idealized object and can become uh, somehow like the lost object, then the, an the analyst side might become an analyst, you no? Know? And my, there might be something in, in that person that might want to be an analyst. And so the analyst might say, this person might go to have the pass, you no? Know? Uh, and go through the process to have a pass. But that logic is Oedipal still, in the sense that it is connected also to how um, Freudism has thought of how one passes through a ritual somehow, mm -hmm. uh, where one introjects a function, you know, the, in this case, the function of the analyst in order to become an analyst. And that would necessarily exclude, for example, other subjectivities that other psychoanalysts have worked through different logics that do not have to do with the master discourse or, or that are outside of those logics, mm. that they might not be contemplating these other forms of subjectivity on how an analyst becomes an analyst. So then psychoanalysis becomes constricted even if it says, you know, we're open, it's about the case per case, mm. you no? Know? So what I try to do is that is to keep on thinking of this plot and how it um, repeats in different scenarios, right? So that we can start opening the questions to dismantle them. It is not that right now I have I have an answer, right, for what to do, but it is about opening the questions so that uh, we can expand our thought and become less segregatory, no? Mm -hmm. Way we listen and in the way we think of psychoanalysis and of what psychoanalysis is and of how that practice of who can practice it no? yeah so, and and i think the paradox of listening is that any listening is inherently a form of interpretation so you cannot listen to someone without interpreting what they're saying and you do that through some kind of theory or some kind of plot or rise right, through some kind of narrative, through some kind of lens, but there's no such a thing as a neutral listening. So the question is, why do we privilege the Oedipal plot as the way to interpret all forms of listening that have to do with psychoanalysis? So you're saying that there are other ways of listening. You're not sure exactly what they are, but at least you're open, right, to the idea of listening beyond the Oedipal plot. Yes. And also I see this form of thought. I, I found that form of thought uh, somehow as I'm thinking of the Oedipal plot, I think that you're thinking of some somehow an Islamophobia plot, no? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I guess the paradox, if we connect the two, because I mean, what I try to show is that Islamophobia pretty much is a master's discourse and uh, that it functions ideologically. So mm -hmm. it's not only a discourse, it also involves fantasies that suture certain gaps in the ideology, right? And that it has this function to, to create coherence, right? I mean, you see this in any form of nationalism, right? What is the function of the Jew and the Nazi ideology? right? They have a certain phantasmatic function within that ideology, right? And so I wonder if we connect the two, if the Oedipal plot is a form of master's discourse, in your opinion, 
And that in a way, it's actually not in the service of psychoanalysis, which as we know from Lacan, psychoanalysis is supposed to be the other side of, of the master's discourse. So there's some kind of incongruence here, right? That there's some kind of tension or paradox at the heart of psychoanalysis, right? Yes, there is, definitely. And I think it, a, a lot of it has to do with coloniality, a lot of it has to do with psychoanalysis emerging in Europe, psychoanalysis also, uh, I mean, Freud only had some texts to his hand to try to understand and to read anth anthropology, right? It, yeah. It's like no theoretical can read everything, right? Right. But the things he had to his hand to think of how yeah. culture is given is, of course, biased. Yeah, and he was struggling with inferiority too, as as a Jew, as you know, a subaltern subject living within the society, he had to assimilate into the dominant culture, and so there is this tension at the heart of psychoanalysis. Which, on the one hand, I see psychoanalysis as inherently liberatory because it comes from an exterior perspective. It comes from you know a Jewish thinker theorist who's who's trying to think about alterity, right? about subaltern subjectivity but at the same time there's the assimilationist part where he's you know rejecting himself to some extent and trying to assimilate into this dominant identity and that's where i think he brings in some of those problematic parts and so there's this tension and it's this it's a tension in freud himself as a subject it's a tension that all of us have the kind of contradictions that we have as subjects. So in a sense, we can think of this contradiction as constitutive of psychoanalysis, just as it is constitutive of subjectivity itself, right? So here's my, my next question. So Lacan tried to move away from the Oedipal myth, as, as you show, by focusing instead on Antigone and the question of ethics. However, you make an original point, which I really appreciate, about reinterpreting Oedipus as a stranger through a critical reading of Oedipus at Colonus. Mm -hmm. And of course, we can connect colonists to colony too, and colonialism, which is uh, mm -hmm. a whole other, you know, deconstructive move we can make. But you do this through Derrida's uh, writing on uh, hospitality, which of course, he shows that hostility, hospitality are also connected. Do you think of uh, strangeness or alterity of the unconscious basically challenges the regime of sexual difference? Is, is, is this what the move that you make here? Yes, I think that there are two senses for it, that femininity has been treated as strangeness, but as it has been through time assimilated, non-binarism is a stranger in some way, right? Uh, what I would like to put into question is that uh, to me, it is very important to, to resignify Oedipus, not only as that one, the Oedipal as that which one crosses in order to be uh, whoever we become or keep on becoming, right? Mm -hmm. But to, to posit how, uh, and to put the central question of the Oedipal as the question of a stranger and on how that is necessary. And in that sense, I think a lot of what you said before, right? that the very, the very Freud, of course, had these incongruences as much as any form of subjectivity, you know, because that's how, what we're formed of. But there's also the importance to, to always be against the part that thinks it is hegemonic, right? So that we can see that part of a stranger to keep on moving and to keep on uh, moving towards other and to keep on uh, and to keep in dialogue always knowing that there's no sense of purity right which is also somehow what I listen in what you said no like there's no this way or the other right it's both live in 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 the same sense but in order to move we need to see both parts. So I also, I see in your work some similarities also in this way of thought, as you also read David Pavon Cuella, you read Fanon's argument in black skin, white masks, to think on how Islamophobia is also interiorized, right? 
by uh, by people by by most people and to think of how that operates within the people you're listening in the interviews right among right. Many other things so i would like to know more about this in your work and to ask you how you think of this um sense of non-purity which mm -hmm. is also against i think uh, liberal psychology for example yeah. right yeah so to kind of free associate a little bit over regarding what you said um so in other words what you're seeing is that oedipus is not just a stage of psychosexual development but that the strangeness of oedipus is something that we have to live with throughout of our lives because it's the strangeness of subjectivity itself mm -hmm. right and so that's the move it's to move away from oedipus as a complex but more uh, oedipus as a condition uh, the strangeness of the unconscious the strangeness of being a subject and trying to come to terms with our own strangeness, right? Uh, and that's what I see you doing, which I think is fascinating. But regarding the question, yeah, so I think what I try to show, because obviously the reason why we internalize oppression is because of the its dominance as an ideology. So we can see this with a sexual difference and that it's not just about the difference between masculine and feminine, but it's also about a hierarchy right? And it's also about patriarchy, and it's about oppression. So in the same way, the ideology of, of Islamophobia, the way it functions, and the way we internalize that, the, the same way we internalize patriarchy, is what is the what is, is their way out of that? I guess that's the question. Or are we doomed, right? And so what I tried to show, kind of using a structuralist account, is that even within the dominant ideology, there's possibility of opening up interpretations and deconstructing the ideology itself it's still not moving outside of the ideology because i think it's such a quick move to do that like for example if we think about capitalism right global capitalism if you want to think about it is the dominant ideology around the world right within that you have different oppressive systems like patriarchy or racism right and so can someone really think outside of capitalism or exist outside of capitalism probably it's not possible I mean, we can uh, talk about a utopian world where we're beyond capitalism, but as, you know, Frederick Jameson and Zizek show, we humans find it easier to imagine the world of, at the end of the world than the end of capitalism, right? That's why we have all these movies where the world is ending, but you don't see a lot of movies where capitalism is ending, right? So similarly, can we imagine a world beyond sexual oppression? Can we imagine a world beyond the patriarchal a regime of sexual difference? Can we imagine a world beyond racism? We have to imagine that world, but as we're imagining it, we're still within that world. I think this is, I think this is the challenge. So what I try to show is, you know, with war and terror discourse, what it does, and sexual difference does the same thing, it positions people either or, as you said. So uh, either you're masculine or feminine, the war and terror positions you, either you're a terrorist or you're a counter-terrorist. Right. So you have two options and you have to choose one. And George W. Bush famously said, either you're with us, you know, the United States or you're with the terrorists. So there is no third position. There's no fourth position. So it's really a binary world. So what I tried to do with, with decolonial psychoanalysis is show that there are at least two more positions that we can map, which are negative positions. But in a way, those negative positions open up new possibilities. So that's the position of not terrorist. So you're neither a terrorist nor a counter-terrorist, but you're something else. And the position of not counter-terrorist. So I have to name them in the negative and then try to positively describe them. And basically the subjects that are interviewed were positions in that world. So they're positioned in a negative space that is not accounted for by the dominant discourse in the dominant ideology, but that is logically possible. Mm -hmm. You see, so the same thing I see with, with sexual difference and non-binary subjectivities or subjectivities that challenge heteronormativity, they're not accounted for by the regime of sexual difference, but they're still logically possible as kind of negative subjectivities. And you talk about that in terms of the abject, so I think it connects to my ne uh, next question. So one of the points that you make throughout your text is how we must distinguish between difference an objection, which I thought is a very important point. In other words, recognizing difference is not the same as rendering certain bodies abject. 
this is to me the one million dollar question how can we recognize difference without falling into the trap of objection okay it is a difficult question but i think that it has to do with how repetition at some point falls and one starts repeating another thing, you know? So there might not be a definitive move from objection, but there might be a movement of what has been made abject, right? And in those movements, things change. But I do not necessarily think that objection will end, right? Uh, also, to me, there it, it's. I, I will mention right the the difference I see between objection and difference, which is um, because in psychoanalysis, I think that most theories have treated it treated sexual difference as always a form that forms after objection in such repetition. But what I I try to say is that there might be like a detour, you know, mm. like I I I want to say you know there's this text I really like on Freud on um, uh, when he speaks of repetition, no, he speaks of the detours that the death drive might make, you know, and when I think of that, I think of repetition as always being the same or more or less the same or he says the circuitous paths of the death drive. I sometimes think might they, there be squares or might they even change the way we die? No, these mm -hmm. towards death. So what I think is that, first of all, to me, objection is mounted in the idea that Julia Cristeva gave and then, that, then Butler retook on how uh, there's a, a me mechanism before the very main mechanism of repression, which is about vomiting and about taking out anything that cannot be internalized. Mm -hmm. and. So I was thinking of the erogenous body before, no, in order to construct that idea of an er of the body and to become an erogenous body to in order to live and not be like a somatic circumstance dying there while crying because nobody saves the infants, you know, one starts constructing this, but at the cost of making object what cannot be ourselves, right? Like the odor that came in, one has to take it out. The milk that was bad, one has to take it out, no? And that to me is a form that then forms other forms of abjection, right? Which to Butler are make even some bodies matter or no, okay. even uh, bodies as a whole. So to me, difference depends different from objection would be a movement, a subjective movement where one stop make, stops making bodies abject, but starts recognizing a difference that not necessarily has to be vomited, no? Mm. That one can live with that difference, also recognizing that difference is within oneself. Mm -hmm. That strangeness that you talk that about. Exactly. That which is strange is part of oneself or already parts of, forms part of oneself. And it might be confusing, right? Because that makes us put down our borders and maybe confuse with the other in some senses. Mm -hmm. But that movement to me is necessary. No? Yeah. And that's also why I'm skeptical within some psychoanalysis that there's always a fight against identifying with the analyst, for example. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think that you cannot fight that. Those are processes that will happen, right? Mm -hmm. But that there is a difference between identifying with that and being against that, or then identifying with that and being able to live together. Yeah, for me, this is because it's a political question that has to do with, you know, I always talk about, again, you see this in nationalism and obviously in fascism, there's always like a seductive, charismatic leader, right? And people uh, identify with the leader. I guess the leader becomes some kind of father figure uh, or mother figure, if you will. And 
the, this kind of politics is regressive, right? So the question for us, especially when it comes to difference, is not, are we, do we want to be the same? That's not the question for politics. The question is, we're different, but what do we want? What is it that we want together? What is it that we enjoy together? Even though we know that we're not the same, even though that we're different. For me, those are the important questions, the important political questions. But I think the, because objection ultimately has to do with disgust. And you see this with all kinds of oppression, right? As disgust at the end. So, I mean, that's why I see with Islamophobia and that's what you see like any kind of oppression, whether it's sexual oppression or racism or even uh, class struggle. It's this disgust with the other who is regarded as inferior, right? And, uh, and that's why they're abject, right? And rendered outside of the normal regime, whether it's sexual difference or something else. And I think the question that I have regarding that, because this is what I saw with my own research, is that, you know, the, the analyst is causing the desire of, of the hysterical subject to create new signifiers, right? To challenge uh, master signifiers, and but still create new master signifiers. So basically, it's cyclical. What ends up happening is we're going to create a new master's discourse. We might think it's more progressive, but this new master's discourse will still render some bodies abject. They'll just be different kinds of bodies. So I have a feeling like, I, I, I don't want to seem defeatist, but sometimes I feel like there's no way out. Uh, and you even said that there's no way uh, to avoid that. So what do you think about that? I think that connects w with my interest in dismantling the Oedipal plot, because precisely the Oedipal plot is mounted on that idea of the primal word Freud proposes that is very similar to this idea of re replicating the master's discourse, right? Many men were in a tribe, right. killed a man, then eat him because he had all the women so that they themselves can have those women. That's why they like him, right? That's right. their charismatic leader. <laughs> they kill him, they eat him, no? And after eating him, it's like, the guilt of why, why, no? But not because they kill this charismatic leader, but because their brothers might kill them, right? Mm -hmm. In that sense, uh, they identify with this leader and that's the internalization of patriarchy, the internalization of uh, Islamophobia, the internalization of whichever process of deslegitimation of others that we might think, right? Right. One interesting move would be to start thinking in other senses. For example, we take this as universal, right? But what happened with the women that take part there as if they were objects to be moved, right? By mm. the, this guy who had all these objects, no? What were they thinking? How did they, did they manage to live with each other, no? How, uh, what is this logic of somehow sisterhood, or I don't know how it would be said in English, no? That is not about fraternity and the, the terrible idea that one might kill you, so you have to be like that master in order to avoid that, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, that's the Oedipal plot, right? The fear of castration, the fear of, and to me, it's like um, these questions must be made because yes i think that usually the world operates that way in a patriarchal way in an edipal way in a master discourse way <laughs> no right but there might be other forms and which are the, those forms if there was no form of sisterhood between those women then maybe there would be no sense of trying to fight for peace in the world for example right mm -hmm. or for trying to to dismantle patriarchy and dismantle Islamophobia, yeah. even if it's always a struggle, no? But it's a logic of being with others, no? Yeah. To me, uh, it always coexists with this other logic of the master's discourse. But at that point that where, where one sees oneself or where one sees the other becoming either a statue or an object of circulation because that's mm -hmm. what usually happens i think when we have our ideals we become either the statue we idealized or we become objects of circulations for that statue no we 
we need to question ourselves in order to again connect with others right so that's what i also really appreciate about this robert because now you would have the platform for example to talk about yourself you know and you decided okay i want to engage maybe in the work of another person and that person in my work so we can have a dialogue and i think that's exactly what it is about you no know, what we that logic that breaks that right form of operating yeah that's uh that's paulo freire right that's that's something i get from him is uh, the importance of dialogue as a praxis that's a revolutionary praxis right which is horizontal it's not it's, it's supposed to go against the hierarchical logic but i guess you know I wonder if we can live in a world without masters, without master signifiers, without the master's discourse. That's a, an open question. But here's my next one. Since you are, you and I are from the global south, you being from Mexico and me being from Egypt, also we're both interested in the liberatory potential of psychoanalysis. Do you think that it's important to draw from non-European myths whether pre-Columbian or ancient Egyptian, for example. For me, the Oedipus uh, uh, myth is not only sexist, so it's, since it presumes that the normative subject of psychoanalysis is male and heterosexual. I find uh, the Oedipus uh, myth to be also Eurocentric, and its supposed universality is problematic in more than one way, right? So what are your thoughts on that? Why, why don't we talk about other myths? Why are we stuck on this, on this one myth? And I'm not saying to reject it or to cancel it because I'm not for that. I'm someone that studied theater. I love Sophocles. I wrote a screenplay called Oedipus Kingsley. So clearly I'm into that stuff, but I'm just saying that to have a more complex world that represents the complexity of subjects and the singularities and all that, we need to have more than one myth, right? Yes. I definitely agree, and, and also not only Greek myths, right, but the, the myths that constituted since the very beginnings, if we could think of that, the basis of our worlds. Mm -hmm. and, and also it's difficult, right, because, for example, here in Mexico City, I could say that it's there's such a mixture of myths and things one could read and that need to be read, but that it's difficult to say if they would be representative of a whole, you know? Maybe it has to do also with the coloniality within myself of thinking, you know, this Oedipal plot as if it was a more explicatory of things that happen. No, but also in that sense, if I find it that way, it is also because at some point it operates that way. So of course, I think that the more myths that are taken, the better, because I also think that it's important to politicize psychoanalysis, right? And to give uh, many as many perspectives as possible. So yes that and you what do you think I, I fully agree i mean i'm you know i'm someone uh that you know i can trace my lineage uh back to ancient egypt from my dad's side and so i'm very uh curious about ancient egypt and i try to learn as much as i can but i also feel alienated uh, because i obviously grew up in a world where i didn't primarily learn about that so i have to like teach myself uh, about my own history and so I'm more familiar with Oedipus than my own culture and that's the effect of Oedipus so you know I, again I'm not for uh, canceling Oedipus or rejecting Oedipus but you know maybe Oedipus needs to be minimized to a, a smaller role and uh, we should look at other <laughs> myths and other characters to learn from and so th that's really my interest is to complexify and and to learn from more things and to bring in an unfamiliar things, especially from the non-European world, right? And by the way, Freud did this move toward the end of his life by focusing on Moses. So he already moved uh, away from Oedipus to Moses, right? The person who's considered the founder of Judaism. And then he makes a radical statement that Moses was Egyptian. So mm -hmm. the founder of Judaism is non-Jewish which is, you know, like mind blowing. So, so this leads me to my uh, final question. 
So uh, in your book, uh, you draw primarily on Kristeva, Butler, Preciado, and Derrida. Uh, but I'm curious as to why you did not engage with the literature on anti-Oedipus from Deleuze and Guattari. And I ask this question as someone who's aware of this theoretical world, but who doesn't necessarily engage with it in, in any meaningful way. But I'm just curious about the obvious absence, because it would be weird for me not to ask that question. Yes. I, I engaged in it only for my dissertation defense, <laughs> right? But I saw that uh, there were many points of separation, and one of them was uh, precisely that my that I would not like to eliminate the Oedipal, right? Mm -hmm. But that I would like to restate another form of reading it and to disseminate it, to disseminate how we think of it. Right. Uh, also, I found that to me, it's incredible to, to read the Les Sanguatari, right? Because right. they sometimes take um, ma so many references and at the same time, they are not, many times they are not worked. I think that they, so, some, sometimes I feel very angry also because I feel like they are these French men that are like, hey, we can say anything we want and we <laughs> won't quote it. <laughs> we won't talk about this anymore. For example, there are times when in Mil Mesetas, no, where they would go like the, the dog on egg and there's mm -hmm. no reference to this dog on egg, but one could go like to that time and would go to these practices that had to do with psychedelics. And then one mm. can these references to a man who used to do psychedelics here in Mexico. No, mm -hmm. there are there's only like they take those ideas in order to make their own story, and that really pisses me off because I sometimes think like. Why would they do this anti-Edipal to go to, to do a practice, which is already interesting, no? But in a place in France, a part of the city where, where people would go and it was not maybe about listening precisely, but about putting those ideas to mm. work, no? So to me that... That sounds ideological a little bit, right? Yes, and that made me think like, okay, if I'm going to engage more into reading the Les Iguatari, I have to to be a little less pissed off with them so that <laughs> the ideas can enter me because right then I could not. So it's also important, no? I think that this uh, strangeness in the other and strangeness mm -hmm. in itself is something one works through time, right? Yeah. No, I think it's a very uh, significant intervention. And I hope more people read your uh, book and engage with it because it's exactly what we need today is to embrace our strangeness and embrace the strangeness of the other and be able to recognize difference without moving into the direction of abjection. Yes. Um, you got the final question. Yes. I would like to ask you, um, I see also in your work a lot of trying to work with fi fighting the idea of the turning around the identitarian enemy, no? Turning out around the idea of um, like how can I say it? Please give me a minute. No, <laughs> take your time, take your time. Yes. Um, I see that you try to use psychoanalysis as a tool of liberation that you engage into listening through trying to listen also to how these courses operate no you also work through the signifier uh, islam as how and you trace how it has been equated to terrorism 
mm-hmm. even if it has nothing to do, uh, but discursively it has been attached. And I would like to ask you how you think of this, uh, how you think of this in practice, how, how, how can there be a change? No, because mm-hmm. I, I could read you listening to this, but I also can see that you propose uh, two other logical forms that could mm-hmm. take oneself out, but how can that operate? How does that happen? How mm-hmm. can that movement uh, appear? Yeah. Um, well, as you mentioned, like it's it has to do with how master, master signifiers work in initiating any signifying chain, right? And any kind of knowledge that's always going to be based on the master signifier. So it's kind of based on shaky grounds, a shaky foundation. What's the thing that holds the knowledge together is something that's arbitrary in the first place, right? But through repeating it over time and through associating signifiers, it becomes ideological. It becomes accepted as common sense, right? So obviously it's so dominant and it's so hegemonic and it's so prevalent that it's hard to challenge that, right? And so what I'd at least try to do is show how the discourse works And then what is the fantasy structure that holds the discourse together? Because that's, I think, the importance of psychoanalysis here, that we don't just talk about discourses and language, but also what is going on phantasmatically to talk about desire and enjoyment and all that. So I try to show that as well. And also talk about what is the impossible real, what is the traumatic real that is covered up by the ideology? Because ultimately, any ideology is trying to cover up the real, and the real has to do with contradictions within oneself or contradictions in society that we don't want to face because they're too traumatic. And so we try to cover them up with these signifiers and fantasies, right? And so I think that's really the the big question is how to, and I think that strangeness is connected to that traumatic real, right? Coming to terms with with that strangeness, because we also don't want to romanticize it because it can be traumatic right that strangeness within us could be related to a past of abuse or related to you know you talk about transgenerational trauma i wanted to ask you about that but that could be a whole topic for another time but that's a big thing that uh, a big legacy of colonialism is transgenerational trauma right people who let's say live in one part of the world and they're descendants of enslaved people they didn't choose necessarily to move to that place they just happened to be there and then they have to live with that. So imagine the strangeness of that, right? It's, uh, it's so coming to terms with all of that in the most direct way possible without covering that stuff up with fantasies and with honestly bullshit discourses, because ultimately that's what we deal, we're dealing with. The master's discourse is a bullshit discourse. I mean, that's another way of putting it, right? Because it, it always begins from a place of authority. I am the master, this is what I'm saying, and you can't question me. So in other words, it's bullshit. But because I am the master, I'm going to repeat this many times. And because I'm the master and I'm repeating this, you're going to believe me and you're going to accept what I'm saying. That's how the master's discourse works. And so we have to call the bullshit out and we have to reject it completely. And then also show how the logic fails, because that's important. And that's what I tried to do in my work, because... Many theorists talked about that there is a connection between the war and terror discourse and Islamophobia, but they didn't necessarily show the connection. I think it's important. This is why theory is important for liberation. We have to be able to show how these ideologies work, how they function, and what kind of subjects they produce. Otherwise, we're not able to resist them if we can't even show that. I think the challenge is that sometimes the theoretical language could be too obtuse, too complex, too complicated, that it doesn't appeal to a wide audience. And I think this is a challenge for us as psychoanalysts because we're talking about difficult things and we don't make it easy because, right, we, the way we talk about it doesn't make it easier, doesn't make it more comprehensible. And that's a challenge that we have to uh, reckon with, that we have to see how we can capture this strangeness, this complexity without reducing it in a simplistic way but also being able to uh, still communicate with people on the symbolic plane, right? Not, Not the imaginary one necessarily. And that's very important in liberation because liberation is collective. It's praxis. 
So obviously a big part of it is dialogue. And I hope that this conversation was an instance of that. Yes. Can I ask only one more question? Absolutely. <laughs> yes. There's this... Uh, it, I, I see continually in, in your work in the, in the colonial psychoanalysis that you speak also of epistemic resistance and of mm -hmm. optic resistance. No? Yes. And until now, and what you have said today, it has become very clear that to you, psychoanalytic theory and theory can help us for this towards this epistemic resistance and optic resistance. No? But now I was thinking if you think not only that psychoanalysis in practice could be a form of epistemic resistance and non resistance, but if there would be other practices like in the street or other forms of... Absolutely. I think the aesthetic is the, for me, the number one. I mean, I come from the world of aesthetics. It's the world I, that fascinates me the most. I love psychoanalysis, but it will always come second to aesthetics for me. I'm not going to lie, you know, because if you think about it, with listening to music, watching films, reading literature, and these are popular forms. They're not like bourgeois things. I mean, people, working class people love going to the cinema. They love listening to music. So I, honestly, this is the realm for me where we can actually work, resist oppression, where we can practice liberation. I think so. And it's, of course, challenging because we have capitalism as a context. We have industries that regulate those worlds. And uh, this has been my challenge as an artist is, you know, how to try to do what I love doing, what I'm passionate about, knowing that everything falls under the signifier of money and what is marketable. And that's depressing. And it's but, you know, it's not going to stop me from uh, making art and engaging with the uh, aesthetics. Mm -hmm. Okay. What do you think about that? Yes, and I also would like to to know if there are other possibilities of um, joining together art practices with a psychoanalysis. No, uh, it would be interesting. For example, practices of body movement in the streets that engage into also listening and seeing how the body moves. Or I don't know. I'm just. Uh, associating freely <laughs> yeah that's a good open question though right like but like uh, an aesthetics informed by liberation ethics politics and informed by psychoanalysis in other words right mm -hmm. yes yeah absolutely and so it brings us back to surrealism which is like the beginning for me and i think surrealism had that emancipatory potential and then you know it's not a major signifier today but i think it's maybe it has to be reinvented Thank you very much. I, I appreciate being in dialogue with you and I recommend everyone to uh, check out your book and, and uh, I'll post a link below to the book and the virtual read through that we did of uh, Oedipus Kingsley. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. And also I would like to recommend your books, Freud and Said, uh, The Colonial Psychoanalysis and also uh, an introduction to critical psychology. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ciao. Ciao.